the meeting to order. Fraser Valley Regional Hospital District Board, um, March the 18th, 2021. Um, a motion for your consideration um, in regard to the health orders. Do I have a mover? Uh, Mayor, uh, Director Fascio, Director Ross. Those in favor? Contrary, carried. Uh, motion to approve the agenda, addenda, and late items. Mover uh, Chris, uh, Director Clute, and Director Lum. Those in favor? Contrary, carried. Minutes of the meeting, uh, February 25th. 2021, is there a mover? Um, Director Crawford and Director Blue. Any errors or omissions? Those in favor? Contrary, carried. Ms. Kinneman? Sure, thank you, uh, Acting Chair Pranger. So the next item is 4.1. We have the Fraser Health Authority 2020-2021 request for capital funding. And we do have uh, two representatives from Fraser Health Authority here with us this evening. We have Dr. Victoria Lee and Mr. Brent Crucial who have a short presentation for you. Thank you, welcome to the meeting, both of you. Um, and we'll listen with bated breath. Thank you so much for having us uh, this evening and uh, certainly a privilege to join you. And I'll start by acknowledging that uh, we're joining you in the traditional and shared unceded uh, territories of the Coast Salish people, uh, specifically Katsi, Samiamu, Kwatlin, Coquitlam, and uh, Tuasin First Nations. So uh, the intent of today's presentation is to go through some of our priorities. Uh, as well as the context of where Fraser Health uh, is in terms of what, where we're at this year and uh, go through capital investments and five-year forecasts and needs. And of course, have some time for questions. I understand that we have a very short time for this. So I'll move through some of these areas fairly quickly. And again, happy to take any questions throughout or at the end. So as you know, Fraser Health has had a disproportionate burden of COVID-19 cases uh, throughout the pandemic. Um, more than 50% uh, of cases at some of the times have been in the Fraser Health region. The map in front of you, although it's quite uh, uh, small uh, for Fraser Health region, uh, we're the most uh, dense uh, health authority in terms of the uh, population size, uh, but also smallest and, and some of the risks of COVID transmission go with uh, uh, those types of things, as well as large uh, proportion of essential workers are in our region. And three communities uh, with the highest burden of cases in BC are in the uh, region, including Surrey, Delta, and Abbotsford. So throughout the pandemic, we have been uh, really focusing on our preparedness as well as response. Uh, when the global pandemic was uh, declared in March, uh, we quickly uh, looked at uh, international picture as well as what's going on nationally and prepared ourselves. And I think uh, there are four things that I wanted to highlight with you uh, in both COVID preparedness and response. And the first area is that, uh, as you know, uh, our region is across the uh, 20 municipalities and there are 12 network of hospitals uh, that are, that work together, but also uh, community services from public health to long-term care to home health, home support, uh, and mental health and substance use services. And having that integrated health system response played a critical role in preparing for and responding to outbreaks in high-risk settings. One of the very first outbreaks that we responded to was actually uh, the Mission Correctional Institute in the Fraser East area. And we brought in our public health expertise, infection prevention control expertise, and worked with provincial and federal partners and developed protocols that became a national standard. So that's just one of the examples, but those types of partnerships and expertise 
uh, were extended to some of the most vulnerable settings, such as uh, emergency response centers and, of course, long-term care and assisted living uh, care homes. The second area that's important to highlight is that even though we've had uh, quite a huge COVID case burden in terms of number of cases, our health system capacity was well protected throughout the response. And even with significant out acute outbreaks, at some of the points uh, right now, we have five acute outbreaks. And at some, some of these points, we've had 100 beds out of the system in acute and 300 beds out of the system in long-term care. We pay a lot of attention to restructuring our system and structures and processes to protect our health system capacity after wave one of COVID and changed how we work together across the region to ensure that our critical care capacity, our hospital capacity was protected. And we've been, I think some of you are quite familiar with some of the congestion that we have had in the hospitals in the past, but we were able to drive that down to consistently around 90 to 95% throughout. And especially compared to other health systems where uh, incomparable number of cases, uh, other health systems and hospitals and critical care systems have shut down. Uh, we've managed well and actually supported other regions throughout the uh, um, COVID response as well. Another thing that's been very important is to make decisions based on data and also evidence and making, making sure that we have an executive EOC structure that is utilized for rapid decision making and we have been running that EOC for over a year now uh, pretty much 24 7 and uh, I think while COVID takes a lot of uh, uh, interest we've also had floods and fires and uh, um, some of the mass trap uh, 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 sorry uh, collision events uh, around uh, uh, that we had to also respond to very quickly so uh, one of the er uh, areas that we've really uh, uh, done very well in terms of using data to make uh, decisions that are sound. And uh, most importantly, partnerships and community engagement have been very critical. Uh, the municipalities, the district and uh, foundations and the public have uh, been wonderful in what they've uh, contributed as well as sacrifices people have made, uh, whether it's through communications, uh, supporting our engagement, uh, supporting through resources and donations, supporting through um, ensuring that everybody's following public health uh, measures. Uh, municipalities have been working very closely with us on uh, some of the uh, engagement with business industry partners as well as in enforcement of uh, public health measures. So I know that uh, as we move out of this current phase, what we're very focused in is this most historic and largest vaccine uh, strategy uh, in the province and probably globally. Uh, we have built our immunization capacity fairly quickly to ensure that uh, uh, we have adequate number of uh, vaccine um, clinics available. Uh, currently in Fraser East, there are actually 10 clinics. Uh, in total in the Fraser Health region, we have 22. And uh, the uh, weekly total of uh, vaccines are noted there from March 15th until April 12th uh, in terms of what our capacity is versus population needs uh, based on the age groups that we're working through. In fact, uh, uh, if you look on our um, online booking system, there's about 8,000 appointments that are available uh, today for the next 10 days, and that's without loading additional uh, uh, schedules that will be coming up next week as well. So quite a significant amount of capacity, and that's been done to ensure that there's accessibility mixed with also population needs and diverse community needs. Uh, for instance, we have Indigenous specific needs and some of the more remote communities um, uh, such as 
uh, Boston Bar will be done as a whole of community uh, with about uh, remaining 300 to 400 people in that area. It's also important to note that majority of First Nations communities are located in the Fraser East region and all of the First Nations uh, communities have been uh, done in terms of uh, their first dose of immunization. So overall at the regional picture as of uh, March 16th, we have uh, uh, provided uh, 143,411 uh, immunizations and I put a quote in there that we had received from a many, one of many, many quotes that we have received as uh, uh, feedback. And uh, I must say from healthcare workers that are giving the vaccines to uh, people that are actually uh, making appointments. Uh, it's been some of the most heartwarming stories that we've heard. And some of the stories, uh, I'll just share one, for instance, uh, that uh, of the two decades, three decades that they've been working with in the health system, this has been the most uh, uh, inspiring and most rewarding time uh, to call people to make appointments for them to get the vaccine and to hear their cheers and tears uh, uh, when the, those appointments are made and then when they come into the clinic and getting the immunizations done. It's been a very rewarding uh, experience. And again, many, many thanks to the municipalities uh, and community partners, industries and the district for your partnership in this very important work. As you know, there unfortunately dual public health emergencies in BC and the illicit drug toxicity deaths and uh, uh, and uh, the number of opioid uh, overdoses continue and you can see some of the uh, differences in terms of number of deaths over time. Uh, I think one of the important things that we have done throughout the pandemic is to uh, look at where the impacts are and have developed additional services such as uh, uh, emergency response centers. There's been increases in services in virtual care as well. And uh, I think it's been very important to uh, partner with BC Housing to add additional uh, health services and more work needs to be done in this area as we're unfortunately seeing uh, overdoses climb. Uh, I think um, it was actually nearly exactly a year ago, March 16th, when unfortunately non-urgent scheduled surgeries were postponed to ensure hospitals had enough capacity. Very quickly in May, the surgical renewal plan was uh, launched to ensure those uh, non-urgent scheduled surgeries resumed, uh, but also that we were able to catch up uh, quickly. And the volume of surgery since that commitment has been made across the region has averaged 104 uh, 207% compared to 2019, and over 74,000 uh, patients were able to get their surgeries since May 18th uh, when those surgeries resumed. And what's also uh, really great to note is that we've had extended ORs, for instance, in Chilliwack General Hospital. We've had net new ORs in Abbotsford Hospital. We've had reduced seasonal closures at the Abbotsford Hospital as well, and Chilliwack Hospital will have uh, more weekend OR hours coming up as well. And again, uh, you know, it requires more medical imaging, CTs, MRIs, and x-rays as well as um, commitment from our, our healthcare providers, whether they're physicians, surgeons, anesthetists, or nurses, uh, leaders. So uh, uh, that's been very positive. And uh, throughout the pandemic, we've looked to find um, digital and virtual solution. And uh, uh, for surgery, uh, we have uh, ensured that pre-surgical appointments are now done virtually, and we've exceeded our target of doing that uh, from 80% to 85% of the time. So that's been a very positive uh, progress even throughout the pandemic. And I'm very pleased to note that uh, we've not had to close any surgeries because of the COVID cases, because our uh, ability to manage access and flow, uh, but we had to close due to floods and fires in some of the other hospitals. Uh, so another priority area is um, uh, work that's stemming from the uh, report uh, from Mary Ellen uh, Trapel-Lafon 
uh, in plain sight, which had voices of nearly 9,000 Indigenous patients, family members, and third party witnesses uh, and healthcare workers that had uh, found clear evidence of uh, pervasive and sy systematic uh, racism that adversely affected not only patients and families, but long term health outcomes. So, uh, Indigenous people having worse outcomes uh, and access to care. So, there are 24 recommendations that came from the report uh, that range from joint governance to uh, cultural safety and compassionate leadership and culture and transparency and feedback process. And we are working with our First Nations and Fraser Salish Regional Caucus partners uh, to uh, implement uh, those actions. And um, most important part of uh, the whole COVID preparedness and response, as I mentioned, have been in partnerships. And as you know, uh, in all of our communities, Fraser Health is the largest employer. And the most important part of that is our people. And our people have endured a lot through uh, this pandemic. I uh, call of the 40,000 people that either work or volunteer in our region as Fraser Health family. And they have been taxed uh, uh, through you know, threats to their own health and their family's health, but also uh, through an incredibly difficult infection prevention control and uh, PPE practices. And not only people that are in the front lines, but people that are working on the technology communications. Most people have been working uh, nonstop without much of a break. And uh, we are quite concerned about uh, burnout and COVID fatigue in our uh, Fraser Health family as we uh, um, have continued our health services and ramped up some of the services such as uh, surgeries and medical imaging. So throughout this, we're looking for uh, creative solutions. And one of those areas is virtual health and digital solutions. As I've noted, surgery has been one of those areas and we've utilized those solutions as you see, even in our booking system for testing to online, uh, booking for immunizations to case and contact management. And with that, I'd like to hand it over to our VP uh, for MIT facilities uh, and technology to talk about uh, why that virtual health is so important, especially right now. Uh, thanks, Dr. Lee. Uh, just a note for folks, my audio is going to come through on Dr. Lee's mic. We're in a room at least three and a half meters apart. Uh, however, uh, I don't want uh, dueling audio systems going uh, on this call. So I just want to emphasize uh, a little bit what we saw with uh, the early wave of the pandemic was this um, really a shutdown across all sectors of in-person services and, and, a, and a, an adoption, a rapid adoption of virtual technologies. And that could be through, you know, food, de food delivery, uh, or other services, but it really took off in healthcare as well, not just for primary care appointments with uh, GPs. Um, but we, um, we looked at this as an opportunity as well as a health system provider you know, what can we do to not just um, keep people safe at home, what can we do to prevent congregating in our hospitals, in our weight rooms, in our clinics, and maybe keep our providers at home as well at the same time? And that's what's exciting about the promise of virtual care. It doesn't work in all applications. Medicine still is predominantly a business of, of, of hands-on. Uh, however, there are numerous programs that we offer where the virtual experience we've actually seen in some cases is leading to better patient outcomes. And, and some of our uh, MHSU services are a good example of that, where in, in a lot of our, uh, our, our group consult, uh, group therapy sessions, we're seeing attendance rates actually increase in the virtual space and people being more willing to share in the virtual space than in person. So what we're doing is uh, we're looking to apply virtual care, uh, ease the burden of travel on our patients, and ultimately, hopefully, help our providers in their recovery uh, by making them more efficient with the use of technology. So uh, we're looking to um, not just recover and go back to the way things were done before, but to take what we can from this situation, try to improve the way our service is delivered. Um, 
I'm going to carry on and now get to the, 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 the crux of the meeting. I'm going to talk about uh, the 2021 capital investments and requests. Uh, I'm going to move quickly and I, I'm sure there's, there's questions and I want to be respectful of your time. But uh, in front of you, you can see the uh, 2021 uh, investments and requests. Um, um, I appreciate um, the one that jumps off the page uh, for me specifically and probably does for you is the Worthington Pavilion. A chiller and cooling tower replacement. This looks like uh, an, an, an injection of, of funds in a facility that is at end of life. So it, it, it does and it should jump off the page. I do want to note uh, that the chiller and tower are fully um, uh, mobile and so uh, it's serving a purpose. We still have uh, uh, patients and residents at Worthington Pavilion we needed to replace that. We couldn't defer that maintenance. We couldn't go with a break fix approach, which we often do with buildings at end of life. Um, but that this is an asset that would, um, when Worthington Pavilion, Pavilion is decommissioned, would move to another location in the Fraser East. Uh, so specifically, with, it would stay an asset that would stay within the FBRHD. Um, just uh, that's 2021 request. Looking ahead at our uh, five-year uh, forecast, um, I don't want to speak about each of these individually, uh, but I do want to highlight one item under the major capital projects, and that is what we are calling our Meditech Advance or Meditech Expanse initiative. Uh, you won't have seen this previously, and it's a large uh, ticket number. You can see $43 million spent in Fraser East specifically, anticipated in, in, in 24, 25, 40% share of that would be 17.2 million. Now, I do want to be clear on this. Um, we have asked the Ministry of Health to fund this project 100%. And we anticipate hearing uh, whether or not that ask for funds was successful uh, later this summer. So summer, early fall, 2021. We, in our business plan that we took to the ministry, we didn't identify FBRHD as a funding partner in this project. So my, my hope is that uh, Fraser Health receives the funds to uh, pursue that project and radically change the provision of care within our hospitals, within our long-term care facilities across the entire Fraser Health region. Uh, in the event our, our ask of the ministry is unsuccessful, uh, uh, there's, it's a, it's a possibility we look to other funding partners, including um, uh, Fraser Health Equity, if there's any funding available there. Uh, one thing we've done is we've tied this project to major redevelopment. So a new hospital in Surrey, a redevelopment at Royal Columbia, we, we, can, we can try to get funding there. We don't have the major redevelopments to target in, 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 in the Fraser East at this point, and the long-term care projects aren't a good good fit to tie that in. So uh, that's a potential in the future, but um, my hope is it comes off the list in, in the fall, even as a potential uh, with the uh, uh, you know, permission to proceed from the Ministry of Health and, and full funding of that request. Um, I, I'll pause there. There's a number of other projects you may have questions about or, or uh, questions for Dr. Lee related to uh, the material she presented. Thank you, um, Brent, oh, sure. and thank sure. you, Dr. Lee. Any questions from board members? Uh, sure, I would. Jason, Director Lee. Mercer Lund. as well, please. Oh, okay, go ahead, Director Mercer. Thank you. Uh, my question's uh, for Dr. Lee, and first of all, thank you for your presentation tonight. I just want to take you back a few months, uh, maybe six months, when it appeared as though vaccines were going to become a reality. Um, our public health officer for the province of BC um, certainly talked about uh, what the priorities for the province uh, were in, in the uh, communities at risk, um, you know, the age groups at risk, and nobody disagreed with that. But following that, it was our understanding that um, the vaccine would be distributed by population. So if we fast forward that to today, it looks like Fraser Health remains the uh, hot spot area for the province, yet places like Prince Rupert this week are advertising that anybody over 16 years old can come on in and get a, uh, a vaccination. And I'm wondering how we square that round peg. 
That's an excellent uh, question. And I think uh, there are a number of things that we're doing to accelerate what we are uh, what we we're able to accomplish. So I think uh, initially there was a significant concern with supplies of vaccine and where the supplies weren't very stable. So phase one of the very vulnerable populations, long-term care assisted living, all of those populations were done pretty standardized way across the province. And I think we ha have now moved from a very limited to su supply to no supply for a little while to now a lot of supply coming in. And uh, Dr. Henry has talked about uh, today about accelerating the age groups. And we are also accelerating in Fraser Health region through uh, specific high risk populations because we have large proportion of those populations as well. And because of ongoing clusters in some of the high risk areas, we have also gone out proactively to immunize. I think there is an, an opportunity for us to work together to ensure that uh, we're able to match uh, uh, capacity to uh, supply and to be able to move quicker where we can. And we're seeing some uh, movement there with the demonstration of moving age groups faster. If I might uh, follow a question. Um, I understand that completely yet. Um, it doesn't really answer the question as to how if the vaccine is distributed proportionately by population, how a place like Prince Rupert can open it up to 16 year olds and we're still at 80. Um, you know, I respectfully accept your answer, but it didn't answer the question. Yeah, I, the supply is uh, currently distributed uh, based on population size and uh, some of the communities, I believe, have been prioritized in, within the region based on size of the population to be able to do whole of community. So I think that's what's happened at, okay. at Northern. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Who was next? Madam Chair, uh, Director Lum here. Go ahead, Director Lum. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Nice to see you. And uh, Mr. Crucial, nice to see you uh, back again. Um, uh, I see, I just looking through the ask here, and um, it's a little bit more than uh, we had anticipated. Um, but uh, I'm curious, uh, the only reference to the Chilliwack General Hospital that I can find is in the under 100K equipment in the minor capital. And, and I'm wondering in this, in this 2021 year, um, ele the 11, 11 million plus that was approved by Fraser Health, um, why only about, I guess, what I'm looking at it, I look at about $64,000 is going to the Chilliwack General Hospital. Yeah, and I, I mean, I, I guess that the, the short answer to that would be that the prioritization process for um, under 100K projects is is based on needs of infrastructure, right, uh, 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 across the entire region. So it was it j just so happened that it was a, a smaller year for Chilliwack. When I look ahead in the five year projection, you start to see more items come up for Chilliwack General Hospital there, including the large one, the, the potential ICU redevelopment, right? But there's um, the, the allocation of under 100K projects is, is, is it's not um, money granted to each facility and then they do what's the priority there. The prioritization is done across the entire region. And then it just so happened that the need wasn't that great at Chilliwack General not the need is great at all our facilities, but relative to everything else happening uh, across Fraser Health. And certainly, I again, I, I think I said this last time we spoke, I wouldn't want to be in your position to have to uh, try and satisfy all of the uh, competing asks for many of these facilities as they start to age and as equipment, uh, capital equipment uh, starts to require to be uh, replaced. But I guess I would just emphasize you know, I do see these forecasted um, capital facility projects and that $40 million ICU uh, redevelopment in Chilliwack um, sure does look good. But uh, it is just, I guess, you know, I, I, I'm looking at that stacked up against the Meditech expense that you just spoke uh, about at length. 
I'm looking at some of the other, again, aging um, equipment needs at, in Abbotsford at the regional hospital as, as some of their capital equipment starts to age out. Um, and I'm just, again, we're just starting to see that um, we're, getting, we're getting further and further behind and, um, and less and less likely to be able to catch up here. And so with some of this $11.9 million, this, this, large, this larger than anticipated ask, I guess I'm just, uh, I find it a little bit challenging that we haven't been able to find a little bit more than, you know, 60, 60 or 70 or hundred thousand dollars in the Chilliwack General Hospital. I was there a few weeks ago and certainly I'm no expert, but the need uh, exists tremendously in that facility. And so much of the Eastern Fraser Valley relies so heavily upon it. So I guess I'll just put my plug in for uh, maybe to the Fraser Health Board when they're working hard on uh, allocating this, uh, that uh, we could show you some up here as well. Okay, thanks for that. Thank you, does that answer your question, Chair? Um, Director Lum, it's just a point I, made. Yeah, I, I, I don't think my question uh, requires an answer further than, no. and um, we're happy to be good team players and that's part of um, existing in a regional system. But um, when we look at this five year um, allocation, I hope the message is, goes back to the board that the Chilliwack General Hospital is a good team player and uh, it scores us some brownie points for that $40 million ICU investment we see coming up, perhaps even earlier than 20, 25, 26. Thank you, Director Lum. Any other questions for Dr. Lee or Mr. Crucial? Director Bales? Go ahead. Hi, I just wondered what uh, availability there is for people that might not have a computer or be online. I do know of uh, at least a couple people in my area that don't do online or computer. And also, second question would be, for people who don't feel uh, or are worried about the security of the online system. I know I heard on the news just yesterday that Microsoft was hacked so, uh, or some of their system. So I'm just concerned about that. Yeah, Thank uh, you. thanks for that uh, question. I just, I do wanna clarify, is that with respect to vaccine booking or the discussion around the, the trend towards virtual health or maybe both? Uh, well, virtual health for sure, because uh, okay. with elders, I know that some of them have been reluctant to even go in for health care. Yeah, and, and, and so, so that's an absolutely fair comment. And I, and I, I, I should have been clear on this, this point. We're not going to force anyone into the uh, use of virtual care. It's not going to be a, to receive this health service, you must use virtual care. That's, that's just not the reality for our system, in particular, some of the at-risk populations that we, we serve. Um, but it's about moving the system and the expectations. I think maybe um, um, think of, uh, 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 of the, you know, the upcoming generation, right, that, 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 that can understand why they can, they can book dinner in a hotel around the world, uh, uh, you know, for tomorrow evening, but they, they, they can't actually book an, an x-ray or a medical imaging appointment in Fraser, Fraser East, and, and they have to wait for the, for the phone to ring and someone to tell them when and where the appointment's gonna be. So we're really trying to shift or, 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 or bend that curve a little bit, but I, I, I totally appreciate your comments. Concerns around privacy, security, or just um, uh, comfort with the technology, it's not gonna be technology forced on people. Um, there'll, there'll always be a multimodal delivery. Are there any other questions? Dixon, Director Dixon. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, 
one comment just i uh, i'm just going to throw another plug in just to support chilliwack hospital as uh, per director lum but he did a very eloquent job of that so thank you for that um and this is just curious are all three vaccinations um vaccines still available or is it um now just the astrogenic i think it is yeah, I can respond to that question. Thank you. It's uh, Pfizer, Moderna, and AstraZeneca that are currently available. Uh, the fourth one that is approved in Canada, J&J &J Johnson & Johnson vaccine, uh, we currently don't have any supply of that, but uh, certainly all three vaccines uh, are available in BC and are targeted to uh, current age groups or uh, high-risk workers. Thank any you. other any other questions? Director Siemens. Go ahead, Director Siemens. Uh, thank you. Um, so on the the Meditech expanse uh, for forty three million, we will be getting an answer, or you'll be getting an answer from the Ministry of Health later this year. Um, so I'm just wondering. How does that then change? I know Chilliwack said that they had some concerns. Um, and I just, I would imagine that if that um, answer is in the affirmative that uh, they will pay 100%, then I would imagine everything else kind of moves around in that five-year plan. I just wondered if you could unpack how that might work. Yeah, uh, thanks for that question. Uh, Meditech uh, Expanse Initiative is not coming um, at, a, at a loss for other capital priorities. Um, basically, uh, the way I, I see it is actually we're finally catching up as a province investing in, 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 in digital care uh, technology alongside the physical infrastructure. Uh, so so it's, not, it's certainly not a replacement. And, and just for a little more context, I mean, what we're trying to do with this initiative is improve the quality of care. That's the fundamental driver behind this, and that's through accessibility of electronic charts, through uh, at medication ordering and administration, online checking against best evidence, and against more importantly, the patient and, and what is gonna be best for the patient. So it's a, it's a quality initiative, and quality driven through an investment in information technology. Um, uh, uh, the 43 million is notional right now, and I'll say that 24, 25 isn't, um, isn't locked down. I could see that, um, a chunk of that actually drifting into 25, 26 uh, um, for, for Fraser East. But absolutely, our, our ask and our intent and our hope is still that uh, that, that project is 100% funded from the Ministry of Health. So just a follow-up question. Um, is there any, um, is there anything um, advocacy that we can do through our, our councils or through our regional district um, that would assist you I guess you'll keep us up to date on that if there's anything that we can do to um, to, to work that through because you know as has been said by the other directors there is a number of challenges coming up and I don't think equipment is getting any cheaper so um, if anything that we can do to assist you in, in getting that fully funded um, so that some of our other tax dollars can go into those other projects that would uh, we'd be willing to do that. I really sincerely appreciate that uh, that offer, uh, Director Siemens, and uh, I, I think um, right now the adv advocacy is really being led through the, the Fraser Health Board of Directors uh, and that membership uh, right now. Any other questions? Sure, Pranger. Go, go ahead, Director Mercer. Yeah, I'm just wondering, uh, and I'm, I'm looking to you or maybe Chair Lum for advice, if we have questions specific um, regarding budget, which might pertain to staffing services, can we refer this to uh, our closed session instead of dealing with it now so more questions can be asked? Uh, so if I may, uh, Madam Chair, uh, through to Director Mercer, um, perhaps we could have Ms. Riley, our corporate officer, speak to that one. If there were, uh, we do have a closed uh, agenda for this evening. If there were further questions uh, related to this item uh, that impacted labor relations, would we be able to uh, move this into closed? Questions and discussion. Questions and discussion. 
I think that um, we would be better to move to another a future uh, agenda. And so, if I if I may just ask uh, Ms. Lounsborough, in terms of the timing of the budget uh, and having to have it presented by, I believe, is it March thirty first? That's correct. So, would we be able to move forward with uh, submitting the budget without having made a decision on the twenty twenty one minor capital requests? We would need to make a decision on 2021 today. So um, just to our corporate officer, um, Ben Ness, would that then necessitate us having another meeting in March then, calling another meeting of the hospital district in order to have this discussion? So uh, just one clear, um, the discussion uh, would be around, play around, uh, labor relations is that my understanding maybe i can clarify i think um what uh, director mercer is asking and what i heard from uh, Ms. kinnaman and maybe this is easier um we've got an item right now after this presentation which is the request for uh, capital funding from uh, fraser health there's a motion on the table asking the board to approve that but it's in advance of approving the budget of which it it exists as a line item in there if this board had questions about specific line items in the budget that may uh, pertain to new staffing, requisition of services, anything that would qualify it uh, uh, moving into a closed portion of the meeting, could we table this item perhaps and then move into closed, have the discussion around budget, and then um, and then reconvene to in this meeting to uh, to to complete the discussion on this ask. Uh, unfortunately, at this time, we have not um, given proper notice around any discussions with respect to labor relations, um, because if um, at the moment um, the resolution to close, we have um, items consideration uh, to negotiations with the provincial government, but not labor relations. So uh, that being said, we could schedule an additional meeting of the hospital district board prior to the March 31st uh, deadline, we could certainly arrange that. What is, what is the wish of the board? I would support um, Director Mercer in, in tabling this item until uh, further discussion can be had on the, on the budget. This is the first time we've uh, been seeing the budget. Obviously we have to have uh, a little bit more in depth um, there may be some other questions, so I, I don't mind uh, supporting if I see. Second, Adamson. So if I could just speak, if I could just be clear, uh, the motion is actually for a postponement of item 4.1. There is a motion there, and it, is that the question? If the postponement of Item 4.1, the motion. So we yeah. do not have, at this moment, we do not have a motion on the table. So it would be a postponement uh, of for consideration uh, for a future meeting of the hospital district board. Is, is there such a motion? If I might, um, it just, uh, you know, it might be my inexperience, Sylvia, or Madam Chair. It just seems like we're we're out of sync, and there needs to be um, this discussion has to be fulsome before we um, to be included into the bigger budget question. So I, I would defer um, to uh, uh, Director Lum. He, he filled in the blanks I was trying to uh, articulate. However, probably I, I lacked in that. Uh, I kind of know what I meant. I was just having trouble saying it. Director Lum. Yeah, I would support uh, postponing the item uh, until we can have further discussion. As long as um, it doesn't delay the uh, the uh, the budget, which I've heard from staff that it will not. Um, could, go ahead. Motion. All right. Do you need a motion to that effect, um, Ms. Kinnaman? Uh, I think oh, that uh, I think that I heard uh, uh, Director Lum and Director Mercer make the motion to postpone. Okay. And I will second that. Well, it's been seconded. <laughs> Third. Is that a, that's Third. A, 
<laughs> uh, tabling, was that a tabling motion? Because there's no discussion on a tabling motion, correct? So this is a, a, a motion to postpone. And so okay. a discussion would be uh, limited to the postponement, the issue of postponing. Um, I'll call the question then. Those in favor of postponement? Contrary? I don't hear, I hear nothing at the moment. <laughs> I, th I think uh, Madam Chair that that passed. Thank you. There, now I can see. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Dr. Lee and uh, Mr. Kershaw for attending our meeting um, and giving us some background. And we really appreciate your input. Thanks so much. Well, thank you so much for your ongoing support and partnership. And if I may, since I have uh, just last uh, thing to say, which is we have seen some vaccine hesitancy in some of the communities. And uh, if you could champion uh, COVID-19 immunizations within your community, seniors and vulnerable people and across um, your partners and your families, colleagues, that would be most appreciated. Thank you so much. And we will, I'm sure all of us will be helping to get the word out. Thank you. Thank you. Bye for now. Have a good evening. Bye for now. Ms. Kinneman. Thank you, Madam Chair. So next item is 4.2, which is the 2021 Hospital District Annual Budget. There is a motion for your consideration. Is there... Um, does this also get postponed then, or can uh, we, we would need we would need a motion to postpone, but presumably, uh, based on the conversation that we've just had, I would expect that that would be forthcoming. Okay. Do I have a mover for a postponement? Um, Mayor Fascio, or Director Fascio, and Director Blue. Those in favor? Contrary. Carried. Um, Thank next you, Madam item. Sir. Next item is reports from board directors, Madam Chair. Anyone have a report? Seeing none, next item. Uh, next item is public question period for items relevant to the agenda. Uh, we have encouraged members of the public to send their email submissions uh, to info at fvrd.ca and also invited members of the public to join our Zoom call. I would just ask Ms. Van Ness if we have any uh, submissions received or if we have anybody on the line. Uh, we have not received any submissions for the hospital district. We do have a number of attendees uh, uh, joining us tonight on our meeting. Um, if anybody uh, that is joining us right now has questions with respect to the hospital district agenda, uh, this would be your opportunity to ask them. Uh, I would ask you to uh, select the raise hand uh, function to indicate that you have a question with respect to the hospital district. And it would not, it would appear that nobody has a question with respect to the hospital district agenda. So I think we can move along. Thank, Thank you, you, Ms. Venus. Um, then I believe we have a, a need a resolution to close. Moved uh, Director Mercer, Director uh, um, Ross. Those in favor, contrary, carried. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now we'll shift right over to uh, Chair Lum for the Fraser Valley Regional District Board agenda. Thank you, everybody. And um, I hope my uh, internet uh, connection is a little bit more stable now. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. I hope. Yes, good. Um, so we'll call the close or the uh, open meeting to uh, order in the first item. Uh, first item is a motion for your consideration with respect to holding this meeting electronically uh, without members of the public present in the boardroom. I get moved by Director Fascio, seconded by Director Dixon. All in favor, opposed if any item carries. Next item. Looking for approval of the agenda, addenda, and late items. 
Thank you. It's moved by Director Mercer, seconded by Director Stobart. Any uh, questions in the agenda additions? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed, if any, the item carries. Next item. 3.1, we have a presentation regarding Tourism Harrison's proposed Municipal Regional District Tax Program Boundary Expansion in Electoral Area C. Thank you, uh, Ms. Lacey. Uh, hi, I'll just share my screen for my PowerPoint. Thank you for the opportunity to present this evening. My name is Lisa Lacey and I represent and volunteer with Tourism Harrison Mills. Tourism Harrison Mills started meeting in 2013, recognizing the growing role of tourism in our community, adding local jobs in addition to our traditional industries of logging and mining. We have met around two to three times a year with stakeholders from Sandpiper Resort, Sasquatch Inn, Sasquatch Mountain, FERD, and more. We are funded by the community and run by volunteers. Volunteer contributions and Destination BC funding has supported a website, signage, and flagging for events. The group and activities are volunteer run. From its inception, we have been open about moving to adopt Municipal and Regional District Tax Funding, MRDT. We have worked closely with Tourism Harrison and we support the tourism activities of the region as a whole, recognizing that tourism does not stop or start at map boundaries. We understand that the decision against MRDT was made by Director Bale's opinion that COVID did not have a major impact on tourism operators, too much tourism and traffic in the area and negative feedback from residents. While our group presented multiple letters in support of MRDT, we believe they were not considered in the decision or referred to in the March 11th meeting, and we will counter the points made by Director Bales. At the heart of this, we feel there was a clear lack of consultation with business and First Nations in Area C. While watching the recording of the meeting March 11th, you can hear Director Bales say, she doesn't see businesses suffering at all. We feel this is a misguided comment based on the lack of consultation. They have been impacted in serious ways, resulting in the loss of local jobs, as well as delays in seasonal hiring. Sandpiper Resort represents 50 full-time jobs, as well as 50 seasonal workers, which equates to 1.52 million in wages and salaries in the FBRD. In March 2020, with the cancellation of weddings and banquets, health order impacts on accommodation in River's Edge Restaurant, it resulted in losses close to $750,000. While 2020 golf rounds played, double due to COVID-19, this does not outweigh the losses and may not continue as COVID recedes. The spinoff of additional golf games also provided needed support to other business along the Loki corridor, including partnerships with Sasquatch Mountain, Sasquatch Inn, and more. The Sasquatch Inn employs 25 to 30 local people throughout the year. They were closed for two months, resulting in 23 layoffs. When they reopened in May, it was with 50% capacity. While they are currently licensed for 147 seats, they can only seat 45 during inclement weather. Events cannot be advertised or promoted, and this led to the cancellation of all events, including show and shine and annual golf tournament benefiting local charities. Sasquatch Crossing Eco Lodge BMB was directly and severely impacted. In 2019 2020, they had 558 room nights, and this past year, only 100. The lodge was closed for three weeks in early 2020, open for three weeks, and then ordered closed by Stahelis to protect their community from COVID transmission. Then when reopened in August and closed in December, this impacted three full-time positions. Stahelis Store and Gas Bar employs 12 people. They're currently closed to the public for close to a year. This totals 15 plus impacted jobs in the Stahelis community. Stahelis Campground has been closed since the pandemic started representing 10 local jobs. Sasquatch Mountain is operating at limited capacity and Area C does not exist in a vacuum. We are a corridor from Mission to Kent, Harrison Hot Springs, Hope and more. Kilby Historic Site is closed during the early months of pandemic and has limited hours and offerings. Many fishing guides living in FVRD lost their jobs for all of 2020. BC Sport Fishing reports a 50 to 60% reduction in revenues and booking. The uncertainty and closures coupled with job losses have been tremendously difficult for anyone in the tourism industry. While there have been increases in tourism in some areas, there are no signs that that will be the case post pandemic with hotel reservations and trip planning in full swing for July. While Director Bales noted an increase in traffic and parking locally, 
we're in the middle of an unprecedented time of pandemic, and there are real indications that travel will move back to normal levels, moving away from enjoying our local regional areas as options open up to provincial, national, and international traffic. Regarding tourism and traffic concerns, informal information from first responders has indicated a decrease in the amount of car accidents through the pandemic in Area C, and we have not seen or heard of an increased need of policing that Director Bales referred to. We would appreciate if there were statistics or information from the RCMP on this point. There was a concern from Director Bales about the amount of staff time spent on this topic. Tourism Harrison Mills is volunteer run. We have not received funds from FERD. Tourism Harrison is funded through MRDT and other sources. This does not represent a drain on staff resources. In fact, the increased taxation and visitations have a positive net impact in the community of Harrison Hot Springs that has been very supportive of Harrison Mills. The introduction of MRDT and Area C would allow us to direct funding, not just to advertising, but to encourage tourism in areas that are under-touristed and move tourism away from areas that are over-touristed. Indeed, the funding could allow us to provide signage and more referred to by Director Bales, encouraging positive and responsible tourism. We can all see the transformation of Harrison Hot Springs waterfront and the movement to a dynamic community enjoyed by residents year round with parks, playgrounds and more. I appreciate Director Dixon and Adamson's comments around tourism in their communities. The tourists are already coming. Having MRDT as a tool allows our community more control and a voice in how that tourism impacts our community, including resident feedback. At the heart of our decision to attend this evening is our deep and abiding concern around the lack of consultation on this topic. There has been no consultation with tourism operators in Harrison Mills. To the best of our knowledge, Director Bales has not reached out to any business or tourism operator other than Sasquatch Inn, who had initiated the conversation. While we have had phone calls from Director Bales this week, they should have happened prior to the March 11th meeting. As tourism is one of the largest employers other than mining and logging, this is a critical concern to the businesses in Area C. Even more concerning is the lack of consultation with First Nations. Both Stahelis and Scalitz are in favor of MRDT. For the draft FERD 2020 regional growth strategy, continued economic growth in the region will continue to provide opportunities for Indigenous communities to diversify and expand their economies. We ask how that is possible without consultation. As the report refers to embodying the principles of UN DRIP, Director Bale's failure to consult or communicate with First Nations in addition to business is a significant concern. We ask that your decision this evening take that into consideration. In the draft regional growth strategy, this is part of a wider collaboration with all municipalities represented by board members today. As Hope, Chilliwack, Harrison Hot Springs, Kent, Abbotsford and Mission recognize the importance of tourism in their communities, FERD is a big part of that equation, tying together communities and recognizing that partnering with member municipalities, indigenous organizations and more is key to developing and coordinating a regional tourism strategy. A vote this evening in MRDT is in line with FERD regional growth strategy. The COVID-19 pandemic has hit tourism extremely hard. This has been recognized at a federal and provincial level, but the lack of support in Area C is extremely disappointing to one of our largest employer groups. We recognize that there were letters sent opposing the introduction of MRDT. What was not addressed in Director Bale's comments were the many letters in support. Although some of the proponents are outside of Area C, again, we are not in a vacuum. We are a community that encompasses visitors from the region and the actions that are taken by our area can either support those tourism operators or work against their, option, their actions. One example is the Droche Farmers Market. They represent 25 to 30 local vendors, small family businesses, small farms, and more. Other letters of support have come in from Stahelis, Scalitz, Sandpaper Resort, DeRoche General Store, Sasquatch Inn, Kilby Historic Site, Fraser Heritage Society, BC Sport Fishing Group, and Champ Charters, all representing major employers in our community. Sasquatch Mountain rejected signing on to Tourism Harrison MRDT without hearing the strategy or proposal. They have stated they want their own MRDT and want to form their own municipality. This, this evening vote in favor would form a stepping stone in that direction. By taking this approach right now, they are jeopardizing the Harrison Mills ability to move forward as part of FERD Area C, although Harrison Mills represents more accommodation providers and rooms. Please vote in favor of MRDT. Area C has already benefited from Tourism Harrison's marketing support since 2013. 
This free support is no longer sustainable and MRDT must be collected by our accommodation partners as well. This supports local business and strengthens ties with your community and the FVRD and allows a sustainable venue for residents to voice their questions or concern around tourism. Our local businesses are in support of MRDT and more importantly, our First Nations are as well. I urge you to consider the backing from our First Nations, input from local tourism operators and the FVRD regional growth strategy and vote in favor of MRDT for Area C. I thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, Ms. Lacey. Right on 10 minutes. Uh, questions? And I uh, see a number of hands. Director uh, Clute, you had uh, your hand up, I saw. Yeah, thank you. Um, just just uh, looking for some clarification for myself. And thanks to Ms. Lacey for the, uh, the eye opening presentation that you've provided us this evening. Um, it is quite a rebuttal to the, the quote. Uh, that was made, I guess, at ESAC by Director Bales that she hadn't heard of any um, misery, uh, businesses suffering. So just a, a question to Director Bales, just for my own clarity. Um, did, she, did you engage with any of the um, mentioned uh, tourism operators that make up the part of Electoral Area C? Uh, uh, Director Bales? Okay, yeah, okay. Um, not, not really, except for those that got in touch with me. So I did talk to a few. Yeah, it was it closed. It was in closed uh, meeting until a week before the East. So I didn't feel like there was a lot of time to consult. And uh, also, only recently, I've, well, I've had a lot of complaints from the community. But I did start to consult with the community, but there really wasn't time before East. And I feel like when we are in an OCP, uh, the beginning of an OCP strategy where we need to find a balance between tourism and rural lifestyle. So I feel like there needs to be time to consult with everybody, residents and everybody else. Uh, Director Bells, you had your hand up as well. Director Falk. Okay, uh, I just, I also saw Director uh, Pranger. No. no. No, okay, sorry. Uh, Director Falk, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I just wanna speak um, as, a, as a business owner who is in the tourism industry, um, what Lacey has sh shared Ms. Lacey has shared tonight is so true. Um, we rely, tourism businesses have been hit harder than any other industry right now. And the, the struggle and the challenge to deal with um, watching you, you know, from uh, the aspect of having to let your staff go and knowing that they, they don't have jobs and they probably won't have jobs to come back to. Business models have had to be changed structures have had to be changed. Like it is, it is a challenging time for anybody in the tourism business. Um, on average, the CFIB says, the Canadian Federation of Independent Businesses says that on average, tourism and hospitality businesses um, and small businesses in general have taken on and added $170,000 worth of debt in a year, each business. And tourism businesses on average over 200,000 or $200,000 worth of debt. Now we're talking operating debt. This is huge in an industry that makes very, very, very small percentages of profit. And so however, however we can work together to, um, to aid them in marketing, you know, the small business doesn't have big pockets or deep pockets to advertise and they rely heavily on, on tourism to promote their businesses and to, pro to promote the community. And I find oftentimes, you know, we as communities oftentimes don't realize what's in our own communities and we don't promote our own communities. And I know here in Abbotsford for years, I had our hoteliers and our tourism staff telling people to go and visit communities outside of Abbotsford because they didn't even know what was in our community and the need to promote our own community. So I can't say loudly enough how important it is and how much my business relies on tourism dollars. Um, I was instrumental in creating the, the regional circle farm tour program. 
And that is an invaluable source. And it, it, it takes a whole lot of communities to make that work. It's not just one community. Um, and so it's, you know, I, I just, I agree with everything that's been said here. And I think it's a very, very important process. And I think we have to support it. So those are just my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Director Falk. Uh, any other comments, questions? Seeing. Dixon. Oh, go ahead, Director Dixon. Um, this may not be the place, so please feel free to uh, mention that. Uh, I do want to thank Ms. Lacey for your presentation tonight. And just to confirm before I ask my actual question, um, I believe I heard you say something along the director Ryan and I were, Anger and I were looking at just the stewardship, uh, responsible tourist. There's way too many in this spot. Here's another great spot. That part of um, your, your thinking or maybe your plan? Um, yes, for sure. Thank you for addressing that, Director, director Dixon. So Robert Rayers, the Director of Tourism Harrison, has already reached out to Director Bales and indicated the opportunity to participate in those forums where the concerns from residents could come to. Currently, we don't have that mechanism. So that would be really port important in directing tourism away from those areas that are over touristed. I certainly have heard the same complaints from residents and we do feel that MRDT would be the tool that would uh, be able to solve some of those things without FERD funding. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, and then Mr. Chair, I'm, this, I'm not seeing this motion on the agenda unless I'm looking in the wrong spot. I know it was on the East one. Um, is, 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 is there a... I'm just look to uh, staff, I think it's 12.8, but um, Ms. Kinneman? Sure, actually, um, if uh, Ms. Van Ness, our corporate officer, wants to speak to that, uh, certainly the subject is on the agenda, as the chair indicated in 12.8, and you note that in the original staff report, uh, the um, motion for the inclusion of electoral area C was part of that uh, East consideration. So through the chair to Director Dixon, um, Ms. Kinman is correct. So this matter went to the um, March Electoral Area Services Committee meeting. Um, and at that meeting, uh, the, the motion to support Tourism Harrison's application uh, within electoral area C uh, was uh, defeated. However, um, uh, this uh, motion has not been considered by the board. Um, and so this item is moving forward um, without the motion for electoral area C. So you'll see on item 12.8 that there is an existing motion that just speaks to electoral areas E and H. Yes. So that, so okay. It, the, so that was my question. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I'll leave it, assuming that it's there uh, to be discussed. So thank you. Thank you, Director Crawford. Okay. Thank you, Chair Lum. I just uh, wanted to thank um, Ms. Lacey for the presentation. It was a good presentation. And uh, I will save my question also for the, uh, when it comes up on the agenda. Okay, we've got Director Davidson. Uh, thank you, Chair. So a couple of questions for Ms. Lacey. Um, how do you like I, I noticed in your presentation that there's there's no mention of of reaching out to community residents it's really just dealing with businesses and that's understandable but how do you go about assuring community residents that the results of your endeavors won't make what many perceive to be a, an over tourism problem um depending on who you're talking to but won't just make it worse i know you said that you can help direct people but can, can you walk me through a, a, a more um, concrete example? Um, and also it's one question. The other question I have as well is that looking at the MRDT website, I noticed that there's all sorts of um, electoral areas out there that uh, are partially um, paying the MRDT. So there's certainly potential to uh, exclude Sasquatch but Sasquatch um, Mountain um, in, a, in a future MRDT, why not pursue that if Sasquatch Mountain is opposed to it? Um, Harrison Mills wants it. Uh, there's precedent for 
having just part of an electoral area uh, involved with it, um, why not pursue that, that avenue instead of, of what you're doing now? Um, thank you. Um, thank you for your comments, Director Davidson. Um, so I'll address your second question first before I, before I forget it. Um, so I, I was not aware that there was the option to, to partially exclude some areas. Director um, of Tourism Harrison, Robert, is on this call as well, so he may be able to answer that better than I can. Uh, another answer to that is that Sasquatch Mountain is in favor of MRDT. They are just looking to form their own municipality. Our suggestion to them is to be part of this MRDT as they move forward in forming their own municipality, which will not happen overnight. Um, in terms of your first question around the concerns from residents and how we would handle that, I, I would argue that a lot of the over-touristing that we're experiencing right now is due to people following public health orders and taking staycations and doing things like that. There is no indication that that will continue. There was in fact a Globe and Mail article just yesterday talking about revenge tourism where people are already planning their trips out of the area. But I do agree that there will continue to be resident concerns. So those tourism concerns would come in through FERD and we would be dealing with them on a regular basis at the Tourism Harrison board level and there, there would be uh, accountability, definitely. And I would say Tourism Harrison Hot Springs, Tourism Harrison has done an excellent job of dealing with resident complaints. And in the end, the MRDT has benefited the community as a whole. I know several families that live there that greatly appreciate the amenities that have been paid for and supported through MRDT. And I've spoken to several directors of the FERD in this, in this um, session here tonight, who while initially hesitant about approving MRDT in their area, have found it to be successful in the end. Thank you, Director Adamson. Um, yeah, Mrs. Through the chair to Ms. Lacey. I, I'm sorry. What year did you say you started this? MRT. You started Harrison Hot Springs at MRT search. You said we, you've been doing it since you started. What year was that? We started in 2013. This is a grassroots community movement. This is not my daily job. We have no, no, I didn't think it was. Uh, yeah. I've been volunteering for tourism Harrison Mills since 2013, and we've been coming together as a community, including those stakeholders that I mentioned previously, including residents from the area. So you, you've done a reach out to the residents it's in those years? Like, when was the last reach out? We have not been reaching out to residents on a regular basis, although those, although those meetings are open. I would say that this decision is more concerning to me and the fact that there was no reach out to the tourism operators or the First Nations. So while I agree hearing from residents is important, we think it's vitally important to also hear from the employer groups and the First Nations in our community who are also tourist employer groups. I, the I MRD, totally agree. Sorry. sorry the, the MRDT would provide us an opportunity to have a more regular consultation and communication with residents that we can't currently do with our volunteer setup currently. Um, yeah, okay, that's great. Um, so when did, the last time did you invite the uh, electoral director to, to your meetings? Uh, we, we have not since the start. We have not been hearing from Director Bales through the pandemic. And, and I would say that that's an oversight on our part to, in fact, have invited her out. Uh, she has not, though, reached out to any of the tourism operators that I'm aware of since the start of the pandemic. So I do feel that while there is a duty for us to consult, it is also on the Director Bales part to consult with our community as well, considering the deep impacts of COVID on tourism. Yeah, um I'm not talking just about COVID. Like before COVID, did you invite the previous electoral director or? Yes, been... yes we did have director Niemi at the, at the early meetings. And um, again, as we're a volunteer organization, it's typically, you know, two to three of us run through um, the good graces of Sandpiper Resort. Tourism Harrison has been reaching out to FERD throughout this process with David Urban and both director Bales. Dave, thank you. Director Blue. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to as well thank um, Lisa for the presentation. I found it really informative. And all that I would add in addition to the comments that have been made here is, you know, notwithstanding the, the issues that COVID has presented, 
Tourism is so important to our communities because one thing that hasn't been mentioned, it's the number one way in which people experience the place that they will move to and where they will create business and create employment. So it might not be that they create employment in the tourism sector, but it helps, it's, um, it all is, is part of the supply chain. And I think that that's really important as, as our communities continue to grow, that we are you know, welcoming people here to experience our communities and, and that that helps all of us. So thank you for your presentation. I found it very informative and uh, I wish you luck. Thank you. I don't see any other uh, questions or indications to speak. So uh, there you. are bills. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Franger. Okay, go ahead, uh, Director Bales. Okay. Yeah. So until recently, I was not aware of of where uh, this was going with MRDT. And uh, the one thing that I found was lacking. Uh, it was enclosed until a week before East, and I didn't feel like the public or residents were consulted. So in the last little while, I, I have consulted with residents. I did a bit of a walk around some of the neighborhoods, and out of 48 people that I uh, managed to get in touch with in the neighborhoods, uh, all, all but two were not in favor of... of more advertising for tourism. They think that the balance is a little bit tilted right now, and it has been for a while. They've been feeling overwhelmed with the amount of tourists, and not just this year, but previous too. They do, just about everybody supports tourism to a point, but they feel like that the balance has been tipped. And that's what I was getting from area residents. I don't feel like I had to uh, nearly enough time to consult with people because, as I said, it was only out of clothes for one week before. And I wasn't kept in the loop for a long time, so until just recently. There is a vision statement from the FERD to do with the strategic plan, and it says people are at the center of everything we do. Whether you're a citizen living in one of the electoral areas or in our member municipalities, the FERD must always strive to put the needs of those we serve at the forefront of our day-to-day -day work. We work hard to exceed your expectations and find creative, innovative solutions that work for our communities. And then there's another one for rural areas. A large portion of the region is rural, un unorganized areas and non-ALR land. And the residents of these rural areas have expressed concerns with respect to, to the loss of the rural lifestyle that they currently enjoy. The RGS recognizes that rural communities are um, an important part of the region's identity and supporters and supports initiatives to protect these communities from growth pressures. The rural areas of the region are expected to remain stable and modest incremental growth over the next 20 to 30 years. The FERD and its members will endeavor to support rural communities by preserving and protecting rural lands for scenic and green space qualities as well as for managing resource use. The health of the forestry industry is critical and viable to many. Dr. Director Bales, I'm gonna, I'm gonna interrupt anyway, you there because we I'm are- just, what I'm trying to get to- the RDS, But we don't need the, the whole- uh, Yeah, what, what I'm trying to get to, us. yeah, what I'm just trying to get to is that, that our community is more than just tourism. It is a rural lifestyle and people, I've never had so many complaints as the last in this term, as far as the overabundance of tourism and, and some of the problems that have come with it. So I, I just feel like we needed to consult with community and residents more, so. Okay, thank you, Director Bales. Director Pranger. Uh, thank you, um, Mr. Chair, and thank you to Lisa for your presentation. We have to also remember that when our businesses succeed, we all succeed. 
who do we go to when organizations are asking for funding or anything else. Um, our businesses need to succeed for our communities to be successful. Thank you. Thank you, Director Pranger. Okay, I think we've had enough uh, discussion on this uh, item. I am gonna thank uh, Ms. Lacey for her presentation and uh, we will move to the next item. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So the next item is 4.1. We have the draft Fraser Valley Regional District Board meeting minutes of February 25th, 2021. Thank you. Let's move. Adamson, move. Adams, second by Director Adamson. All in favor? Those, if any item carries. Next item. Item 4.2 is the draft Committee of the Whole meeting minutes of February 25th, 2021. Thank you. It's moved by Director Fascio, second by Director Stobart. All in favor? Opposed, if any, the item carries. Next item. Uh, 5.1 are the draft uh, Regional Indigenous Relations Committee minutes. It is an information item, but happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Any questions through on this item? Seeing none, next item. 6.1, we have a notice of motion by Director Wendy Bales. Thank you. This is for all, we have a mover and a seconder on this item. Move. Okay. And, okay. Second. Seconded by Director Bales. Discussion on the motion. Clute. Uh, go ahead, Director Clute. Um, thank you. Uh, just uh, a question for my own. I'm on the agenda and I didn't see anything attached to that. Um, just to Director Bales, what's the rationale for postponement? And then secondly to staff, if postponement's granted, um, is there any negative detriment or anything pending that would impact that? Sure, I can speak to that, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, this, uh, it, it says the board may recall back in uh, 2020, uh, we did a garbage service area alignment for electoral areas C, F, and G. And part of the work in that realignment was to do some further analysis uh, on electoral area C and staff is already undertaking that work. Uh, as I understand it, a report was going to be coming in April uh, when Director Bales put forward this notice of motion. And so at committee meeting, it was determined that this could be postponed until uh, that full report was brought forward in April. Okay, uh, Director Bales, do you have any uh, comments on your motion? off and just wait for it, April and and uh, I hope that if staff uh, does bring any motions with this that they keep the items separate so that we can agree on separate items that, that might come up so that's my only request and I'll wait and see what staff comes up with. Okay, are we ready for the question? Um, all in favor? Opposed? The motion carries. Next item. Uh, next item is 7.1. We have the Stala Hohoma Treaty Table Representative. There's a motion for your consideration. Thank you. So we're in a second on the item. It's moved by Director Adamson, second by Director Popov. Discussion? Seeing none. All in favor? Opposed if any of the item carries. Next item. 7.2, we have the KC Treaty Table Representative. Thank you, it's moved by Director Lowen, seconded by Director Ross. Um, all in favor, opposed if any the item carries. Next item. 7.3, the Metro Vancouver Aboriginal Relations Committee Observer Member. Thank you, it's moved by Director Clute, second by Director Fascio. Uh, questions, discussion, seeing none, all in favor, opposed if any, item carries. Next item. Moving down to 8.1, we have the Electoral Area A and B Heritage Conservation Service, the Tajme Museum Kindergarten Schoolhouse Project. I'll Thank move you. it. By Director Adamson mm -hmm. and seconded by Director Dixon, discussion. Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed if any, the item carries. Next item. 
8.2 is a 2021 grant and aid request for the Chilliwack River Valley Residents Association in Electoral Area E. Thank you. It's moved by so moved, Director Engar. Engar, seconded by Director Dickey. Uh, discussion? Uh, yes, Chair, uh, very briefly, if I may. Go ahead. Just like to say, uh, these guys are doing a wonderful job, the volunteers in our community, and uh, I'm, I'm um, very uh, happy to support them ongoing. Thank you. I've heard good things about the ambassador program, Director Engar. And so when you uh, are able, please uh, send my well wishes to the uh, Residents Association. I've heard it's um, not only preventing uh, issues in many cases, but it's also uh, just uh, a well-liked program by uh, visitors as well. Certainly will. Thank you, Chair. Uh, next item. At 9.1, we have the Fr Fraser Valley Regional District North Bend Sewer System Service Area Amendment Bylaw number 1598. Thank you. It's moved by Director Adamson, seconded by Director uh, Siemens. Uh, discussion? Seeing none. All in favor? Opposed if any. The item carries. Next item. 9.2, we have zoning bylaw amendment number 1619-2020 for Hemlock Valley. Thank you. Moved, Bales. It's moved by Director Bales, seconded by Director Dickey. Discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Opposed if any, the item carries. Next item. Bylaw number 1615, which is the building numbering regulations amendment for electoral areas E and H. Thank you. Moved by Director Dixon, seconded by Director Engar. Discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed if any, the item carries. Next item. Moving down to permits, I believe that you have your script in front of you, Mr. Chair. You believe correct. Pursuant to Part 14, Division 9 of the Local Government Act, this is the opportunity for the FBRD Board to hear from the public regarding the three development variance permits listed on the agenda for this meeting. Anyone who believes that their interests are affected by the proposed application will be given an opportunity to speak. If you have any verbal comments with respect to these development variance permits, you are joining us by Zoom on a computer or smart device. I'd ask you please press the raise hand function when it is your turn to speak. You'll be asked to unmute yourself. If you are joining us uh, by phone, please press star nine. And this will notify staff that you wish to speak. When you are prompted to unmute yourself, please press Star six. Those of you wishing to speak are asked to begin your presentation by providing your name and address, which will be recorded and form part of the official record. Please limit your comments to five minutes and confine your remarks to the application at hand. Ms. Kinneman. 10.1, we have development variance permit 2020-06, which is an application to reduce the exterior lot line setback at 43802 Lock Road in Electoral Area C and I will just draw the board's attention to three letters of opposition that were received. Thank you. And is there anyone who wishes to uh, speak to this item from the public, Ms. Van Ness? Uh, I do know we have a, a, a number of people attending our meeting tonight. If there's anybody on the call that would wish to speak to this development variance permit, this is your opportunity to do so. And you can indicate your wish to speak by raising your hand. And it appears that there's nobody uh, that wishes to speak to this item, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Van Ness. And what's the board's wishes? This is uh, electoral area directors. We have a mover and a seconder. Uh, there is a motion before you. Move. Davidson. Dr. Davidson, seconded by Director Dickey. Discussion? Bales. Go ahead, Director Bales. Okay, this one is incredibly tough. It's come back. Uh, this is the second time it's been through an application. They have um, tempered their application so that the setback is reduced uh, once again. Uh, I'm, I'm, I was very swayed by the letters to a point and then, but um, the staff also assured me that the RAR standards have been uh, met and that there would be a biologist to supervision, uh, to be there to supervise the, um, 
the rebuild and basically the, the, the footprint where he wants to put his house is pretty much the same as what was there previously uh, when he had a house that he tore down. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling a little bit torn, but I'm leaning towards, I'm supporting this application with the reduced setback, so. Thank you, Director Bells. Any other comments? You ready for the question? All in favor? Opposed if any, the item carries. Next item. 10.2, we have development variance permit 2020-16 to reduce the rear lot line setback to facilitate an addition to an ex existing accessory building at 52984 Yale Road in electoral area D. Thank you, and Ms. Van Ness, uh, any um, comments from the public? So this would be the opportunity for members of the public to uh, raise their hand and uh, make any comment. Maybe just pause here. And it would not appear that anybody uh, would like to speak to this item, Mr. Chair. Thank you, and what is the board's wishes? Dickey moves. Moved by Director Dickey, seconded by Director Stobart. Discussion on the item? Seeing none, uh, all in favor? Opposed if any, the item carries. Next item. 10.3 is development variance permit 2021-03 to reduce the front setback for deck posts and eaves to facilitate construction of a deck roof at 262 First Street in electoral area H. And I will note that we did receive one additional letter of support for this uh, DBP. Thank you and Ms. Van Ness. Uh, now would be the opportunity for the public to uh, speak into this uh, development variance permit. That's correct. And it does not appear. There's nobody that uh, has raised their hand. So I think we're good to um, uh, discuss this item. Thank you, Ms. Van Ness. And what's the board's wishes? Director Dixon. Dixon moves the motion. Thank you. And seconded by Director Stobart. Discussion on the item. Hearing none, all in favor? Opposed, if any, the item carries. Next item. 11.1, .1, we have modification of the Glen Valley and Matsqui Trail Regional Parks Operating and Maintenance Agreement with the City of Abbotsford. There's a motion for your consideration. Thank you. Move in a seconder on this item, please. It's moved by Director Blue, seconded by Director Lowen. Discussion? Uh, hearing none, ready for the question. All in favor? Opposed, if any, the item carries. Next item. 11.2 is a personal care mobile home covenant for 285 Cossacker Road in electoral area H. Thank you. There's a motion that's moved by Director Adamson, seconded by Director Dixon. Uh, discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed, if any, the item carries. Next item. 12.1, we have the 2020 to 2022 strategic plan. Uh, I just want to thank the communications team for being able to pull this document together so quickly uh, based on all of the feedback and the workshops and sessions that this board has undertaken over the last number of months. And there's a motion for your consideration. Thank you. Uh, moving to seconder, it's moved by Director Seaman, seconded by Director Blue. Discussion? Uh, don't see any. I'll just add my uh, comments, my thanks, not only to the staff, but to the board. Um, through uh, through a, a challenge of meeting um, online via Zoom and doing our strategic planning in a way that is not how we normally do it, which is face-to-face -face and in the boardroom, I thought uh, we did a pretty good job and staff did a, an amazing job, especially a shout out to our communication staff, uh, Again, uh, we're able to kind of work to distill this document down into a very uh, easily uh, readable um, document. And uh, again, uh, strategic plans are uh, in, in their very essence, a series of best guesses. In our last strategic plan, nobody identified global pandemic, but uh, certainly um, when I look and read through some of the actions and the plan, 
the planning uh, entails. Uh, I think we are in extremely good stead uh, moving into the next uh, term of uh, directors. So thank you very much. Uh, call the question. All in favor? Opposed if any, the item carries. Thank you. Next item. 12.2, we have the 2021 LMLGA resolutions. Thank you. Uh, mover and seconder. It's moved Move. by Director Clute, seconded by Director Pranger. Discussion. <clears throat> Director Clute. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I uh, just want to thank staff for working on this and, and for the uh, directors that brought this forward. Um, we did, as your rep this afternoon, uh, it was at the uh, Lower Mainland uh, LGA uh, executive meeting. And as of right now, I believe there's only 18 uh, resolutions uh, before the uh, LML or the Lower Mainland LGA. So uh, just a, a tap out there to uh, member municipalities. You have till March 31st to come up with any resolutions. And right now there's it seems to be a uh, there's not that many on the table. So a good opportunity or a good year to, to put forward uh, your resolutions. Thank you, uh, Director Clute, And thank you uh, for uh, representing us on the Lower Mainland LGA. Big shoes to fill there with uh, Director Adamson uh, stepping away from that board. But uh, thank you very much for your work. Uh, I'll call the question, all in favor? Opposed if any item carries, next item. 12.3, we have Clean BC Organic Infrastructure and Collection Program, Electoral Area A. Thank you, it's moved by Director Adamson, seconded by Director Stobart. Discussion, hearing none, all in favor? Opposed if any of the item carries, next item. 12.4, we have a facility authorization for Revolution Resource Recovery Park, Inc. in Abbotsford. Thank you, that's moved by Director Blue, seconded by Director Stevens, discussion. Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed, if any, the item carries. Next, Next item 12.5, we have Agricultural Land Commission application for a non adhering residential use at 35444 Hartley Road in Electoral Area F. Thank you. There's a motion um, is moved by Davidson. Director Davidson, seconded by Director Adamson. Discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Opposed if any, the item carries. Next item. In 12.6, we have Community Resiliency Investment 2021 Fire Smart Grant application. Thank you. It's uh, moved by Director Crawford, seconded by Director Mercer. Discussion? Seeing none, oh, oh Director Adamson. Uh, yes, um, thank you. This is this is a great, and I'd like to thank staff for applying for it. I do see, oh, that it, it's not very much money to do the big area we got. Is is there any way of, of applying for different areas in the regional district instead of just the one one overall? Uh, through the chair to Director Adamson. Uh, back in about November of last year, the FERD actually did submit a grant under a separate stream for some of the uh, fire smart act, act activities and other um, wildfire prevention measures that were noted in the community wildfire plans. Um, once we have confirmation and we can share uh, with the board uh, the results of that application, um, there would be a, an opportunity for a, a broader area to have some of those activities done. This application is to have someone that can actually do the work. Okay. Yeah, Go ahead, sounds great. I, yeah. Sorry, Chair, I just follow up. Yeah, it sounds yeah. great. I've had um, people asking me about the fire safe and how to get to get it happening. So I think there's definitely an appetite for it in, in my area. Thank you. I may, Mr. Chair. Yes, go ahead, Director Ingar. Yes, thanks again to staff for pursuing this. It's really uh, number one on my list out here in the Chilock River Valley. And I should note that uh, the uh, FireSmart BC is offering through, uh, as UBCM is offering a, uh, a recent uh, seminar, Fire FireSmart seminar. And so any other directors that want to take advantage of that, I think it's, it uh, looks like it's going to be a good event and we should, uh, we can probably all learn something. I know I'm, I'm eager to learn as much as I can. Thank you. Thank you, Director Engar. Any other comments on this item? Uh, hearing none, call the question. All in favor? Opposed, if any, the item carries. Next item. 12.7, we have UBCM Community Emergency Preparedness Fund grant application for Emergency Operations Center. 
Thank you. It's uh, moved by Director Adamson, seconded by Director Dickey. Discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Opposed, if any, the item carries. Next item. 12.8, we have Tourism Harrison and Tourism Chilliwack proposed Municipal Regional District Tax Program Boundary Expansion in Electoral Areas C, E, and H. Thank you. And there is a motion. Uh, Mr. Chair? Yes, uh, Director um, Stobart. Yes, I would like to recuse myself from this discussion as I have a personal relationship with a number of the businesses that are uh, under, under, the, uh, under the magnifying glass here. Okay, thank you, Director Stober, uh, for declaring your uh, potential conflict. And uh, to uh, staff, or sorry, to uh, directors, we have a mover and a seconder. I would we'll... like to move. I, I believe, actually, Mr. Chair, that Director Engar was going to introduce uh, a motion. Yeah, I heard Director. Go ahead, Director Engar. I, I, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, and, uh, yes. Um, I do have it in front of me, and uh, this was the result, if I could just say briefly, during my rather rushed outreach, no people in my community wanted to see any more tourists. So uh, I was really trying to find out a solution that would work. And fortunately, uh, Director Dixon and I were able to secure a unique position with the uh, uh, Tourism Chilliwack, and uh, it'll provide our residents an ongoing voice to enable tourism to advocate for our own needs as more and more tourists come. So um, I can just read it out if that's appropriate, staff? Sure, and, and just so you know, the staff did put it on the screen. Oh, there it is right there, yeah. But for sure, read it out for those who maybe are joining us by phone. Very good, the first part is, is uh, that the Fraser Valley Regional District Board support Tourism Chilliwack's application to implement the Municipal and District Tax Direct, excuse me, Regional District Tax Program mm -hmm. within the Fraser Valley. Regional District Electoral Areas E and H from 2022 to 2027. And the second part is the part that we have a slight addition to what you see in your agenda. And, it's, and it begins with, and that staff be directed to draft a letter of support for Tourism Chilliwack's application, which includes the creation of Electoral Area E and H stewardship committees. And this commitment by Tourism Chilliwack of regular direct dialogue with areas E and H residents to consult with and advocate, advocate for improving impacts and outcomes from tourism. So I think this is an excellent uh, um, uh, solution for my area and also area H, which I'm sure Director Dixon can speak to as well if she'd like. Thank you. And do we have a seconder on this motion? Director Dixon, did you second this? Thank you. And uh, discussion, Director Dixon, did you have any comment? Yes. Um, just, um, I, I think, uh, I think this is, um, I'm pleased with what's, what's come forward here. And I think it, it is in many ways an ideal way for, um, to find that balance that I know, it, of course, same thing. I heard residents say, no, no more tourists, but I've got businesses in uh, Area H as well, and um, and they also enhance the area. So it's it is about trying to, um, yeah, you know, ideally keep everybody happy, but at least an opportunity for the residents to to let the tourism board know, well, this is what's going on, and this is why that's a concern, or this is working really well. So I'm looking forward to um, to that uh, new work. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, Director Mercer, you have your hand up? Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Could we go back to the resolution on the screen, please, just for a sec? The motion, sorry. Thank you. Just ask staff to uh, put uh, the uh, resolution back on the screen. So my, my question is, um, seems to have gone. Just they'll just try to reload it. There we go. There it is. Thank you. My question is: uh, is does tourism Chilliwack are they aware of um, the last? Um, uh, it's a long sentence in the end. That but the last three lines are they? Is tourism Chilliwack aware of that requirement on their part? Is this a, a new addition or is it something that uh, has been done by them before? If so I may, if I may, oh, Mr. Yes. Chair. 
Yeah, go ahead, Eric Ringer. Yeah, this uh, the the uh, exact outcomes that have been offered to me personally by the executive uh, director of the tourism Chilliwack were that they would facilitate us to operate as a stewardship committee and they would provide direct dialogue uh, four times a year coming out and visiting my community personally and uh, um, with the intent of advocating for our area to help improve uh, the impacts and outcomes from tourism. So exactly as it reads, I'm hoping it's precise enough, but that is exactly what I've heard in conversation directly from the uh, uh, Executive Director of Tourism Chilliwack. And I believe uh, that's similar to um, Director Dixon's uh, response as well, but she can answer that as well. If I could just add, uh, Mr. Chair, through to Director Mercer, uh, Tourism Chilliwack did attend the EASC meeting uh, earlier this month, uh, and this was discussed at length. Thank you. Thank you, Director Lowen. Did you, did I see your hand up? Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. My question is, I don't see this uh, addressing Area C. Yeah. Uh, or am I missing something? No. Uh, thank you, uh, Director Lowen. Um, perhaps staff want to uh, weigh in on this, but I understand that this was a resolution, as it stated, coming out of the EASC uh, meeting. Um, and probably um, substantiated some of the feedback we heard tonight in our delegation. Um, certainly what is presented here would not um, supersede any directors who uh, perhaps wanted to put a motion, a separate motion uh, from this on the table uh, after we deal with the uh, EASC business that was approved. But um, I think uh, staff's intent was to present uh, what came out of the EASC uh, meeting for the board's consideration. Uh, that's correct, Mr. Chair. Um, typically with our agendas, EASC and RACs make recommendations for the full board's consideration, uh, but a motion from the floor uh, with respect to area C would be in order once this one matter has been discussed. Any other uh, comments on uh, this particular item, Director Ross? It's just speaking in support of um, the, the tax. I, I understand, you know, Director Bales has some residents there and in other areas that may have some concerns with the results of the more irresponsible tourists. But it seems to me if you read the staff report, this tax and the initiatives that are going to come from um, implementing this tax that it, it covers will actually address those concerns. And I'm just going to quote the staff report because I rarely say things as well as staff do. <laughs> it just says um, develop marketing initiatives to promote leave no trace, pack in and pack out, Adventure Smart, Ski to Sky Destination Development Council has created a code of conduct for visitors. And scrolling down to the bottom of the page, it is seen as an opportunity to leverage a collective voice and advocate together for positive change, which in turn creates a better experience for both residents and visitors. So, uh, so I think I understand that some people, you know, prefer not to have tours, but they are there, they are coming. And I see the work that comes from this group is actually going to um, create signage and other initiatives that will address a lot of the concerns, hopefully, that residents have. So I'm in support of this. Thank you, uh, Director Ross. Um, other comments, board director? Director Pranger. Go ahead, Director Pranger. Um, this m motion, um, I Director Ross said it very well because staff said it very well, um, but this does not negate um, the, um, ability to bring a motion forward uh, in regard to um, the uh, delegation and, and the area C. That is uh, correct, Director uh, Pranger. Um, Thank you. I think the intent was to do the easy one first, the one that uh, had some support through ESC, and then um, give board directors a little bit of time to consider what they've heard uh, earlier on in the meeting 
And uh, should a board member, as was stated uh, earlier by our chief administrative officer, should a board member um, wish to uh, introduce a motion from the floor, um, they would be permitted to do so. Uh, so I don't see any other comments on this particular item. So are we good to uh, deal with the motion from Director Engar? And I'll call the question. All in favor? Opposed if any. Aye. The item carries. And uh, Director Fascio, I recognize uh, Director Fascio. Mr. Mayor, uh, sorry, Mr. Chairman, for your indulgence, I would like to make a motion from the floor. Go ahead, Director Fascio. That um, the motion for consideration that the Fraser Valley Regional District Board support Tourism Harrison's application to implement the municipal and regional district tax program within the Fraser Valley Regional District Electoral Area C from 2022 to 2027. Second. Thank you. Second. Seconded by Director Pranger. Discussion on the item. Director Fascio. Yes. Yeah, I've got you. Director Fascio as the uh, as the person introducing the motion. You go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Tourism Harrison has uh, been on uh, was um, created in 2006, and it's. Um, it's done an outstanding job in our area and other areas, which has been noted this evening in electoral area C as well over the years and certain areas of the districts of Kent. They have a very um, well organized um, um, director and staff that are very well versed in, in marketing and getting, getting their heads into the beds as well. Our strategic plan identifies a collaboration with our community to identify tourism in our, in our areas. Scenic 7 document identifies the importance of our communities for tourism related travel and visitation. Let us acknowledge the significance of, of our relative areas and working collaborative to get the MRTT will increase visitation, maintaining jobs and economic benefit. It's a win-win-win situation for all and I think this is an important issue. Uh, it has brought a great amount of visitation and the economic drive to the village of Harrison Hot Springs since 2006. In 2007, the village received their portion of the tax to do all the beautification improvements, which has benefited tremendously. Um, trying, trying to stop visitors from coming to our area. I'm not sure how that would ever be done, but I did with a meeting with Bonnie Henry last week and the resort municipalities. I did tell the good doctor that if I laid my body across the, the highway, they would still be coming to Harrison. I'm afraid that's the way things are. Uh, we are resort communities. Uh, we're, we're there to, to um, receive, obviously, we, we expect people to respect the environment, which is very important where we live. We live in one of the most beautiful areas of British Columbia, and let's, let's all work together to make this an even better relationship. And I wish to thank uh, Ms. Lacey for her presentation this evening as well. And thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the time. Director Fascio, Director Bales. Yeah, I still have to restate that I don't think that the communities have been uh, properly consulted. We're at the beginning of an OCP where I think people will, um, will be able to speak to what kind of a balance they want to see in the community. Uh, there has not been enough uh, help for policing and there's been a lot of agrimony over the last, over this term actually, even before COVID with, with um, with tourism uh, complaints from residents about tourism. I do appreciate that there needs to be a balance. Um, we are a rural residential retirement, but also tourism area, but the tourism depends a lot on, on the natural uh, 
the naturalness of our area and um, and I think we have to also be aware of that and cognizant of the balance as far as that goes. I, I really don't feel like it's been in open enough, long enough for consultation with the area residents. And I still stand by uh, needing more of an OCP type process for the area residents to chime in on what they want to see for the area. And, and I will say that they, they do appreciate the businesses and I've supported supporting local, especially through COVID. Uh, I know that the lockdowns and the uh, regulations have hit all businesses hard, well, all the small businesses especially. And I have supported, uh, I have um, advocated for supporting local businesses, uh, but I think we need a lot more consultation before moving ahead with something like this. Thank you, uh, Director Bell. So the comments from board directors. Davidson. Go ahead, Director Davidson. Um, thank you, Chair. So. Um, if you again step back to the the regional growth strategy, just to that one sentence from the 2004 document, um, the RGS recognizes that rural communities are an important part of the region's identity and supports initiatives to protect these communities from growth pressures. And it, again, comes back to talk about rural lifestyle. Um, the uh, 2020 RGS, or sorry, that the current one is in draft form. And if you do a side by side comparison of the two documents. Um, you see that the, uh, the draft RGS is, is a lot more um, focused on tourism. All well and good, but it's still only a draft document and the round of public consultation as part of that communication plan just hasn't happened yet. So, you know, we've got, we've got something that, that came out of closed a couple of weeks ago and we're kind of, uh, in my mind, I guess to echo um, Director Bale's sentiment, the, the, the public consultation portion of this, the, the opportunity for, for public feedback just hasn't been there. I mean, business has been well organized. Their, their, uh, their response has been amazingly swift, but there just hasn't been opportunity at all really for the, uh, uh, the community to respond. And I think it's, it's premature to, to um, vote this in over the heads of the of the wishes of the residents at this time uh, so i don't really support it um, thank you thank you uh director davidson uh any other comments director dickey go ahead thank you mr chair and uh, i'm always careful about uh taking direction from electoral area directors when issues come uh, to the board regarding their their communities uh however i do feel that uh, strong, healthy communities include not only a strong residential sector, but definitely a very strong business sector. And in light of the comments that have uh, been engendered from the business community in electoral area C, I think I'll support that uh, MRDT come to electoral area C. Thank you, Director Dickey. Director Lowen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the uh, year 2004 was referenced just a moment ago. Um, that coincidentally uh, coincides with basically my term, my time on council. And I'm, when I think back to when I first uh, came to this office, the demographic uh, changes we've experienced in the valley is is quite remarkable. Uh, the, um, the the population is moving eastward. Uh, there is an increased interest in uh, in the resources that the valley and the uh, the environs here that offer are the people of the lower mainland in terms of tourism and not only our own but uh, visitors to this area and my uh, view is that a healthy tourist economy in harrison uh, greatly benefits the uh, healthy economies of uh, chilliwack and abbotsford as well and i i think that um, uh, to we need to th see this as part of a larger piece uh, of the exploiting the beauty of the Fraser Valley from yeah. east to west, from north to south, the entire region. And um, I, I think that the residents, wherever they may be, um, this could be C or it could be F, it could be any of the uh, e, uh, electoral areas, 
Uh, they may have moved there at one time 15, 20 years ago to get the rural lifestyle, but I don't think it's realistic for them to expect to preserve that forever. The, the times are changing, and so we, we, we need to keep in mind. We need, I like what uh, we saw in the resolution that was just passed uh, to try to manage those outcomes, those, uh, the negative uh, impact of tourism somehow. And I'd like to see that for Area C as well. But I, I don't think it's fair to the businesses. Uh, my goodness, um, employment for locals in a, in a bustling, uh, thriving tourist uh, industry. Uh, I can't see how anyone could want to turn that down. Thank you. Thank you, Director Lowen. Uh, Director uh, Blue, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just offer one comment and, and that is, you know, a, a couple of directors have suggested that there hasn't been time for sufficient feedback or comment or, or something to that uh, consultation, I think was the comment. And I would respectfully ask, what is it that they would provide feedback to? It is only when you have someone with the expertise to understand even what the possibilities for tourism are and to put together a draft plan that they can then consult with the community and get their ideas and their input and help to inform and educate them that they're going to overcome whatever fears they might have that are, we don't know why people hold the fears that they do, but um, I think that this is a, a good move toward making all of those, you know, the comments that have been made about having um, healthy growth in tourism and, uh, and growth in business as well. So I'll just offer those comments, thank you. Director Engar, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I just want to throw a, a little bit of sympathy towards Director Bales. I know what she's up against. Most of the people, if not all the people in my valley were similarly very stressed about the, the idea of condoning more tourism. And um, so and it was in effect, I think a short time frame that we had to deal with it. However, I would like to extend the opportunity to uh, uh, Director Bales to perhaps consider uh, entertaining something, something similar to what we've done. Uh, whether or not it would work for her, I don't presume to uh, give her direction in any way. But uh, my suggestion would be perhaps the uh, tourism, uh, tourism uh, Harrison would be amendable to allowing your area to be also a, um, a stewardship of a stewardship arrangement where you could consult with the tourism people on a regular basis and they would then have to advocate for your personal needs, the, the people that are living in your area. So it's just a thought I wanted to put in if when if uh, Director Bales would uh, like to go in that direction, we'd certainly be happy to see her do so. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Director Popov, you had your hand up. Yeah, just 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 briefly, I I, I certainly am in line with uh, Director Lowen, uh, Director Blue, and 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 Mayor and Mayor Fascio's uh, comments, uh, uh, taking the line out of uh, Brian Brian Minter's um, uh, line. This is we're all a team. We're all better together, and I I certainly support this wholeheartedly. Director Mercer, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You know it's. I know it's difficult, but um, when individuals from the lower mainland, uh, from the Vancouver area, head east on the Trans Canada, or people in the interior head south on the Coquihalla Three or One, uh, they're coming to the Fraser Valley. They're not coming to A, B, C, D, E, F, G, or H, or Chilliwack or Abbotsford. They're coming to the Fraser Valley. I, so we have to treat it as a whole, not as silos. Uh, they're not going to see electoral areas as uh, boundaries uh, when they decide where and where and if and where they're going. Uh, what I've seen uh, on the positive side from the tourism is actually contrary. It's actually the control they bring to tourism. Um, they've um, the signage that they put up, the directions that they put up, uh, the stewardship that they uh, help create actually enhance the safety of tourism, which is gonna come whether we want it or not. Uh, I see it as a positive thing and I, uh, for all of us, and I don't define it by boundaries uh, and nor will the tourist. And I support this fully. Thank you, Director Mercer. Uh, other comments for a first time on this item? Don't uh, hear any. 
Um, anyone else for a second time? Adamson. Okay, go ahead, Director Adamson. Um, at the East, when we discussed this, I, I expressed how in my area I was against it. And, and now that it's in, I see that it wasn't um, the bad thing that I thought it was, but it, it was, yeah, it was, it's different. Every case is different. But what we've done tonight has really nothing to do about whether they sign on to this or not. What we're doing here is we're stripping electoral director for power to represent his people. You know, if his, her people told her, we don't want it, who are we to force them? Like, we might as well not have electoral directors. The city might as well do it all. It's, it's wrong, but. Thank you, uh, Director Adamson, Director Clute, go ahead. Just, just to that point by Director Adamson, but yet this evening we did hear a presentation of many people from that area who are in favor. So you're right, it's a balance. And but I wouldn't suggest that it's a one-way street. It's it's completely we're hearing from both sides. Thank you. Uh, other comments. Davidson. Uh, go ahead, Director Davidson. Yeah, just to reiterate, um, you know, I'm, I'm looking at the the letter from Sasquatch Mountain. And they're pretty, pretty explicit saying, uh, I quote, we are open to discuss, but at this time, Sasquatch is not interested in fees to cover tourist advertising. Um, some of the letters of support that um, uh, Ms. Lazy referenced, you know, they're from, from businesses that are, you know, outside of Area C. And it's pretty clear too that municipalities, uh, you know, if, if more people are heading to areas see for tourist activities you know the chances that they're going to stop at a at a business in, in, a, in a large municipality or city and have a lunch or a meal or whatever um, will only help their businesses but it but it but it does come back to um, director adamson's comment this is really is a case of of uh in my mind um the the larger municipalities essentially uh treating the electoral areas essentially to some extent as as a as a as a resource to be consumed for the benefits of their own businesses. Um, I don't know if that's way out of line, but but I can't not help but but uh, have that thought strike me in all these discussions. Um, it, it's pretty clear that the residents do not want this, um, or at least the residents we've had a chance to talk to. Uh, the consultation hasn't been there, yet here we are um, ready to charge ahead, apparently at least from the, the comments so far, and, and, and do it anyway. And that's just agreed just to me. Thank you. Dixon. Thank you, Director uh, Fascio and then Director Dixon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm, I'm not going to, um, I believe everybody has their, um, with all due respects, they have their say. It's a, it's a free country and we have a freedom of speech. But there are businesses of great importance in Area C. Like the, like the Sasquatch end was mentioned, the Sandpiper, the uh, Sasquatch Crossing, of course, the, the Stahelis um, business on the corner of their, of their reservation, which are closed at the moment. And of course, there's always um, a large amount of traffic prior to COVID uh, that goes to the Weaver Creek spawning grounds. We get five or six buses that come into Harrison every year Either to have their lunch and then off to the spawning grounds or vice versa. Um, I have, um, it, it's, it's a very busy area, uh, but uh, it's, it's, it, the, there are businesses there which are dependent on tourism. And of course, when you have, when you have a place like the Sandpiper uh, and the other bed and breakfast is placed, they are dependent. We've seen the numbers tonight from one particular bed and breakfast from 558 prior COVID to 100 uh, and then they were uh, and then they're closed. So there are businesses of importance there which which uh, which is an economic drive for this whole area. We're all where I'm coming from here let's get together. Well I don't know why we're getting into arguments or trying to to say that uh, you know we're uh, 
um, we're, 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 not, we're not listening to a certain electoral area directed. I've been on this board, probably one of the longest ones on this board. Uh, and uh, I've always had the greatest respect for all the directors, all of them. And, I th and I've always found that at, at, at some point we, we come to a, a collaborative reasoning and work together on something. Obviously, we all, we all have our yes or no's to, to say whether we agree or we don't agree. That's part of the de democratic process. But in no way am I, am I even thinking that I don't uh, agree with uh, or disagree with uh, Director Bales. She's doing her job as an electoral director. I am here to represent the MRDT, which I think will be beneficial for all, uh, for, all for our areas. And I'm gonna leave it at that. Thank you very much. Director Fascio, Director Dixon. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just, I will be supporting this. I think that when I was at ESC, I, uh, I uh, uh, didn't. Um, but since then, I've heard what I feel is the other side of the conversation. So uh, to me, this is making more of a balanced decision that, um, yes, some of the residents don't want it, maybe all, I don't know. But um, it's there's more than just the people, uh, the residents in, in any electoral area. And I had to wrestle through that in mind. We can't put a lock on our community. So I just feel that this is a way to have a voice, have a say, to balance it out and to do something that, that uh, in the end, hopefully will be something that's good for all, all of us uh, on the board, not, not just one single electoral area or not. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Director Falk. You had a yes, please. Comment? Go ahead. I just wanna, I just, I just wanna um, say that the very things that make your communities really special, and the reason people go there to live in the first place, are so many of these um, tourism um, opportunities. And, and I just I just think sometimes, you know, we move into a community because it's it's really wonderful because of all these quaint little things that make that community special. And then once we get there, we don't want anybody else to participate or share. And all I can say is that if you were to lose some of those businesses in those communities, those communities would have a very different feel. And what would it feel like if those businesses that right now you think are creating this this um, this problem with over tourism. What if they weren't there? Think about that. Some of these guys are on the edge. They might not be there. And I've gone into communities where they worked very hard to stop growth because they didn't want it to grow because growth was uncomfortable. And you go back after a council came in and stopped that growth. And it's not a nice community anymore. The very things that make it special are being threatened right now. And yes, there's always gonna be inconvenience. Growth is uncomfortable and it's messy. Barns with animals are messy. But you know what? Do you want an empty, clean barn? No farmer wants a clean barn. And so I think we have to really remember that the very things that you, that, you know we might be wrestling with and some of the community might be frustrated with are the very things that give it its essence, that create that wonderful feeling. And that's why they want to be there. So I would just, I would just caution that, you know, it's easy to listen to people complain because people react out of fear and fear never makes a good decision. And I think sometimes the, the, the residents aren't on board because we didn't lay it out properly for them. We didn't ask the right questions. We didn't, we didn't um, showcase the opportunities properly. Um, and you can just ask, are you for or against? And, and you don't give anybody anything to go on. And I think, I think if you were to really lay out and ask them, what are they willing to risk? Are they willing to lose those amazing places? What happens if there's no gas stations? There's no grocery stores. There's no restaurants because they're all being threatened. And what happens if they're not there? Are they still going to want to live in that community? And so, you know, like I say, it's, you know, we all want to live in a community. And then when we get there, we want to bar the door shut so that nobody else gets there. 
And I just, I just want to caution you that, you know, when we make these decisions, we're not just affecting a few residents who might just be uncomfortable because there's a few more cars. But I've talked to so many businesses that, you know, that are in trouble right now. And how many can't find employees? And if the jobs aren't there, the, the, they can't necessarily live there either. So now you've got residents who are living in an area where they can't find jobs or employment. And so I just, I just caution you, this is a bigger picture. It's not just about a few residents who may or may not like something. Sometimes the very things, you know, I didn't like as a kid taking my cod liver oil, but it was important. And sometimes the very things that we need aren't the necessarily the things we like or we, we think we want, but they're the things we need. And so, yeah, thank you. Director Falk. Okay. Yes. Yep. Uh, just one second. I'm just going to look and see if we've had haven't heard from any directors here, and I think we're getting precipitously close to turning this into a free for all debate. So I'm going to allow a couple of more speakers, and I'm going to close the debate and call the question. I will allow Director Bales. Go ahead. Okay. In my walk around, uh, it was very. Uh, very last minute walk around in communities because there wasn't much time after being out of closed. But I, one of the questions I asked quite a few questions just to, to try and get some response as far as uh, whether they felt, for instance, that a committee would help to uh, correct some of the behavior that's happened with, with tourism whether it's the garbage or the lack of policing or uh, in, in some places they've complained about people going to the bathroom in their backyard and, and uh, oh, fights breaking out and no policing. There's been, it's not uninformed. And I also talked about what well, with the, uh, idea of a committee because it was brought up. I did bring that up. We've had committees about other things. We've had committees about gravel pits and they did not feel like it worked. And they didn't want to feel like they'd have to spend time on a committee on something that they've been dealing with problems over the, the last few years, more so this year, but over the last few years for sure. Uh, as far as, um, not wanting tourism, it's not a question of not wanting, it's about a balance. And basically the problems that the businesses locally are seeing right now have a lot more to do with lockdowns and regulations than the normal uh, flow of tourism and the normal openings and the fact that they can do a lot more under normal situations. So. So I do understand that businesses are suffering, but also residents are suffering too. And they're, they're feeling the stress of, of all this extra uh, traffic and, and it's kind of like throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Our area depends on wildlife for tourism, but it's getting to be more like wall-to-wall -wall people and fights and garbage and, and just excesses. And, I, and the people I talk to do not believe that a committee will, will really resolve that. And there's been, there's been too many long lasting problems that have not been resolved that easily by just having a committee. So I still do not support this. I do support tourism, but I don't support this because I think once you get something like this in place, it's almost impossible to reverse it if, if it didn't uh, get the results you're wanting to get. I would be looking to area E and H and seeing how it works for them and definitely would be more considerate of it if there was time with the OCP to actually have an informed public consultation. Thank you, Director Bales. Okay, uh, I'm gonna call the question. I've got a short comment. So uh, I'm just 
realize that it, this is a little bit uh, out of the ordinary, the discussion we've had tonight, but I believe it's a healthy one. Um, I think we've uh, demonstrated, albeit maybe a little messily, that uh, you know boards sometimes have to disagree with each other and uh, find uh, uh, a resolution to move forward. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I heard a lot of uh, discussion tonight. I think there was a characterization that this was an, I think, quote, egregious kind of overruling of uh, electoral area director. I found that comment to be a little dramatic. I think there was, this is a, um, a healthy debate. This is not overruling or trying to do it. We're, we're going to do a democratic process here tonight. That's what this is. Um, the idea that tourism somehow uh, snuck up and became something that became of interest to the Fraser Valley Regional District uh, recently is uh, is probably more egregious. We've had tourism identified in our strategic plan for many, many, many years, more than I can remember being involved in this board. Um, with the MRDT, um, in my mind, this is allowing what looks to be a partially volunteer run organization the ability to have access to uh, some funds. And instead of focusing just on destination marketing and uh, trying to blow up the tourism population and, and provide way more uh, people uh, attracted to the area, I think the focus should be placed um, similar to what directors Engar and Dixon have done, where it moves from de uh, destination marketing to destination management and only by gaining access to some of these funds in my mind is a uh, is a area going to be able to start to manage some of the uh, effects and side effects of uh, over tourism uh, that director bales did a good job in explaining and i believe what the pain points that some of the uh, residents in uh, in Director Bale's area and in all of our areas and in our municipalities are feeling when irresponsible tourists come into our areas and uh, and don't treat the places that we love so dearly with respect. But I remain unconvinced that uh, supporting the MRDT is going to have a negative uh, a net negative effect. So I will be uh, supporting the motion this evening. I'll call the question. All in favor? And a motion carries. Thank you. Sorry, Chair. Um, I, I I had an internet glitch as you were asking for the opposed. Um, I'm I'm opposed to it. Director Director Davidson, Davidson you'll be Marcus myself Adamson, too. Director Adamson and Director Bales. Mm -hmm. Was there any other directors that I should uh, have staff note were opposed to this item? I do not hear any. Thank you, uh, directors. Next item. At uh, twelve point nine, we have the COVID nineteen safe restart funding. There's a motion for your consideration. Thank you. Move her in a second here, please. Moved by Director Ross, seconded by Director Clute. Uh, discussion. Hearing none. All in favor? Opposed? If any, the item carries. Next item. Uh, moving down to 14.1, we have development permits issued in 2020 by the Director of Planning and Development. This is an information item, but I'm sure that Mr. Deneluz would be happy to answer any questions on this item. Thank you. And any questions through to Mr. Deneluz in this very, very busy department? <laughs> Hearing none, next item. 14.2, we have new usage data for trails on Sumas Mountain from the Stalo Collaborative Stewardship Forum. Questions? Bring none, next item. 14.3, we have the Lower Mainland Flood Management Strategy. Again, it's an information item, but happy to uh, discuss and answer any questions. Thank you. Questions? Mr. Chairman? Director Painter. Um, in in as you read through some of the um, material, um, I would request that we at one point invite Mr. Tyrone McNeil, uh, Chief uh, Tribal Chief Tyrone McNeil, to come and speak to us and give the perspective um, on on this issue uh, to a board meeting. Thank you, uh, Director Pranger. And um, um, I've had that discussion with uh, staff about entertaining that delegation and just trying to determine 
uh, what the best, um, I guess, the, the best uh, case scenario is for that. And also to just try and work out uh, scheduling on that. But yeah, that's an excellent idea. Any other questions, comments on this item? Hearing none, next item. Uh, item 15 is items for information and correspondence. If anyone wanted to separate any of these items to discuss. Thank you. Any uh, questions or comments on any of the items before you? Don't see any, next item. Looking for reports by board directors. Thank you, directors, be opportunity. Adamson. Yeah, Director Adamson, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, I wanna thank all the communities uh, for moving quickly this week. The library uh, got a message out to all of us saying that uh, funding had been cut for, for um, um, items related to people that have trouble seeing and that the federal government had, had cut this year's funding. And uh, so um, there was a send out asking for letters from all the, all the cities and everybody did a great job. So they've restored the funding for, for 21, but um, the libraries, most of them all across country, you know, they, they use this every year. And what they would like us to do is uh, draft a letter saying, whereas the Fraser Valley Regional Library and most of the libraries in Canada uh, fully provide spe specialized services for the visually impaired and print this able through the Center of Equitable Library Access, uh, CELA is the, the acronym, and the National Network for uh, Equitable uh, Library Services, uh, NNELS. Um, whereas both agencies are engaged in the accessory book production and collection and receive 4 million annually in federal funding to support this much needed service that whereas the federal government has announced they're restoring the 2021 uh, funding to these services previously uh, announced in the 2020 fall economic statement that they have been taken out um, uh, but have not committed to fund them past that there be a resolved that Fraser Valley Regional District and all the cities are invited to do the same thing. Send letters to the Minister of Employment, the Workforce Development, Disable Inclusion, inclusion uh, and the, the um, Ministry, uh, Prime Minister, Deputy Prime, they got the whole, everybody here. What I'm gonna do is I'll forward this on to staff. But what we're asking um, is, thank, we're thanking you for moving quickly and, and saving it uh, for a year, but we want to get it permanently there. So. Um, I'll send this to staff and uh, I'd like you to, to uh, make a motion. This is my motion. Great. So um, uh, staff when Director Adamson brings the uh, requested uh, action advocacy piece forward, I think we'll uh, bring it back to our uh, next uh, meeting. And uh, I guess the some of the, as uh, Director Adamson said, some of the urgency is is uh, is not there yet. So I think we can do that. Uh, but good yeah. to hear that uh, some action was taken. And thank you, uh, Director Adamson, for your uh, advocacy. You. Director Mercer. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, through you to staff. Sometime in the late uh, fall of last year, I had, I had asked for a, a short recap on uh, search and rescue numbers, fundraising, uh, and the like. The intention of that um, was to lobby through the LML, LMLGA through a resolution to the government that they've properly fund our search and rescue groups so that these very well-trained and expert uh, volunteers that we all depend on uh, aren't spending time on fundraising so they can buy the necessities of their crafts like ropes, carabiners and equipment to do what we ask them to do in the back country. Um, common sense um, just certainly tells us that if the province is uh, relying on these folks and we're relying on these folks and their volunteers, they should be properly equipped and not donating their lunch money to buy ropes. Um, I paraphrase, obviously. Um, and I'm wondering if there's still time and if there's still time uh, uh, for staff to get these numbers together so a, 
a very learned uh, uh, request a resolution to the LMLGA can be forwarded before the deadline comes. Uh, through the chair to Director Mercer, I believe that the deadline for LMLGA is the 26th of March. Um, I don't think that our finance team has had an opportunity to liaise with all of those search and rescue organizations and get all of that data together um, due to other uh, pressing items within the regional district uh, office here. So I would have to follow back up with them. I'm not sure that there's going to be enough time before the 26th to get that going. I think if, if I might, Mr. Chair, yeah. I, I don't know if it has to be uh, firm with clear data. I think um, anecdotally, all of our search and rescue teams and we, all of our all of the directors here know it as well, um, that they're all uh, suffering for the almighty dollar to do the job that we ask them to do under the worst of conditions. So, you know, maybe it's just a, a letter uh, that the government properly fund. Um, and I'd be happy to help you. Uh, Ms. Kinnaman with that kind of language. I don't know if we have to go through a, a science project to get all the data to get our point uh, in a resolution. Um, Ms. Kinnaman, maybe I can jump in as a former uh, chair of the Lower Mainland Local Government Association. I can recall uh, at least one resolution coming forward on um, um, speaking to uh, some of the points that uh, Director Mercer has made just around SAR and the, and the lack of commitment for uh, provincial funding um, just across not just not just our region but across British Columbia. Um, I would be happy to um, speak to some of my colleagues and I know um, through uh, Director Clute um, is make sure that my colleagues are still colleagues that are still serving on the board, but uh, can find out if we can um, see where those some of that resolution uh, language has gone because a lot of background data work has gone into that. And so um, maybe um, we can we can do a little digging there and, and uh, come up with a good uh, a good outcome. Uh, and if I may further add to that, uh, Mr. Chair, I do believe that uh, there is an opportunity for us to send resolutions straight to UBCM. Obviously, those resolutions are treated with a little bit less weight uh, than if they had gone through the LMLGA and, and received that endorsement. But um, if through that conversation uh, with Chair Lum, uh, there was a desire to do that, we can certainly send something direct to UBCM for the September convention. Adamson? Yep, go um, ahead, Rick Adams. Yeah, uh, through the chair, I, I was on that committee for a while. Can't um, our representative, uh, uh, Director Clute, just do it himself, like do a resolution from the from the executives. Yeah, we did so that. the Lower Mainland Local Government Association can also yeah. uh, introduce uh, executive resolutions. And if I I can't, I I just don't exactly know who's still on the the board. Uh, Director Clute would be able to tell me, but I know that it was Squamish that um, had brought a motion forward on uh, regarding SAR. And so I'm happy to close that loop and maybe there's a, a mechanism for us to still uh, still get this on the table even and you know specifically director Clute has pointed out that uh, you know there was uh, it might be a little bit of a light year for resolution so uh, maybe this is a, a, a good opportunity. Okay, uh, other uh, directors. Director Ross. Yeah, just uh, Director Clute mentioned earlier, the LMLGA AGM is coming up and we're looking for resolutions, but um, also we have a couple of openings for director at large. So just wanted to put it out there. If anybody from the FERD is interested, love to have you um, join our board. So maybe fellow get a nomination package and fill it out as quickly as you can. Thanks. Excellent. Director Clute. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, uh, Director Ross, for bringing that forward. There was a discussion point this afternoon. Uh, there is a couple openings, and it would be great to have uh, some uh, representation from the Eastern Fraser Valley. Uh, predominantly, it's been the metro area. So uh, certainly, if anybody uh, is curious about it, um, here's an opportunity. And, and like Director uh, Ross mentioned, uh, it would be great to, to see some people put their names forward from different member municipalities as well. Yeah, we've, um, it's one of the things that we've kind of uh, 
spoken about at length about ensuring that um, the Lower Mainland Local Government Association is truly a, a representative, and that means of all all communities and electoral areas, large and small. So, um, yeah, I think it's a, just to put my two cents in my plug, I think it's a, it's a great organization and um, it's worthwhile. Any other uh, any other comments or reports from board directors? Don't hear any. Uh, let's go to the next item. Next item is public question period for items relevant to the agenda. As I understand from our corporate officer, we did not receive any email submissions, but I'll just turn to her to see if we have anybody on the line. We no longer have anybody joining us on the, the line, so there'll be no questions. Thank you, Ms. So Van Ness. Next item. Just looking for a motion to close the meeting. Thank you. It's moved by Director Fascio, seconded by Director Dixon. All in favor? Opposed, if any, the item carries.